This is Going Inside, Healing Trauma from the Inside Out. Hosted by me, licensed trauma therapist John Clark, Going Inside is a weekly podcast on a mission to help you heal from trauma and connect with your authentic self. Tune in for enlightening guest interviews, immersive solo deep dives, real life therapy sessions, and soothing guided meditations. Follow me on socials at John Clark Therapy on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, and apply to work with me one on one at johnclarktherapy.com. Thanks for being here. Let's dive in. Bob Falconer has been working with trauma and healing for over 50 years now. IFS is his major modality, but he has studied and uses many others. Um, uh, Bob recently released uh, his newest book, The Others Within Us, Internal Family Systems, The Porous Mind, and Spirit Possession. Uh, for the past decade or more, Bob has devoted his himself full-time to IFS work, and in that time, he's attended all levels of IFS trainings and has been a program assistant more than 18 times. Um, Bob, I, I, um, I'm wondering if you want to keep expanding on that bio a little bit as to who you are and, and how you got here, because I know there's a lot more to it, but that's just a snapshot of maybe what's what you've been up to lately. Okay. Okay. And um, somehow, let, let's start with the real stuff, not the academic stuff. Love it. <laughs> I come from a, one, a family from hell. Look good on the outside, church going, but both parents were addicts. My father was a sadistic child molester. Mom was occasionally institutionalized for her mental illness, but that was hushed up. Both of them were addicts. Dad was a stone alcoholic. Mom was a binge drinker and prescription pill addict. Dad often had others of his cronies who were also child molesters living in the family with us. So there were multiple men abusing me and my brother. My brother was a couple years older and he started abusing me too. Uh, my brother committed suicide when we were teenagers. My father was murdered when I was 21. Um, so by all odds, I should be living in a dumpster, dead, or in prison. I sort of joke sometimes, it's, it's not really a joke. Women go to therapy, men go to prison. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's not really a joke. Yeah. But, so I survived, I think, because spirit knocked on my door in various strange ways that I didn't recognize as spirit. But also, I'm, I'm more stubborn than a mule. And I got this idea, I'm going to try everything available to heal from this kind of major trauma. And I sort of went through all these different therapy techniques, many of which were damaging, were not helpful. Yeah. The history of modern Western therapy is pretty grim. But anyway, a lot of them were helpful, ego state therapy, Ericksonian hypnotherapy, gestalt therapy at Esalen, voice dialogue, psychosynthesis. And I think of all of these parts works, traditions that realize our mind is much more like a team. It's much more like a football team than a boxer <laughs> or a tennis player. That's the way we're structured and it's a good thing. Well, all these parts works traditions, I think the best now is IFS because it's the most potent and it's the most respectful of all these different parts. Yeah. And I used to have this perhaps arrogant attitude that people who were respectful were not potent, they were sort of weak. That, that was absolutely backwards. I think IFS is so potent because it's so profoundly respectful of each person. And then as I worked more and more with all the parts of all these people, you. You get into people deeply enough, there are things in there that are not part of the person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the others within us. And yeah. discovering that and having that put in my face in a way I couldn't ignore it has uh, changed my focus in this last 10, 15 years. Yeah. You're already getting to one of my questions, which is around how you came to be so interested in unattached burdens and developed your process for working with them, which is in your new book. Um, I want to come back to that. I also want to hear a little bit about the therapies that didn't work, so given your childhood, given your background, given the the the, um, the capital T 
traumas and the 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 list of them that you mentioned um what did those first attempts at healing look like with ther- therapy and and what didn't work well there's so much that didn't work <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know the recognition of childhood trauma and childhood sexual abuse is very very recent there was a major textbook of psychiatry in the late 1960s that said incest is vanishingly rare less than one in a million families and when it happens it's often good for the child that was a major psychiatric textbook in the late 1960s you can't be more wrong (laughs) yeah so if any abuse survivor went to them they would be trashed by that whole attitude and Mm -hmm. why are you making this up and stuff like that same with the idea of ptsd in general that was until about 1980 denied by all the major institutions the only reason it got recognized is because of the vietnam veterans rap groups who they knew ptsd happened they were living with it you know and this one psychiatrist, Dr. Robert Lifton, organized them, and they went to Washington, put pressure on the, the government, which put pressure on the academics, and that's finally how the diagnosis of PTSD got in the DSM, got recognized as an official thing that's real. Yeah. And so the entire therapy establishment was as wrong as you could possibly be. <laughs> and i'm so glad they're now the big trauma experts and you know all these same institutions which did everything they could to destroy this are now oh we know all about this i would really like it if they'd say gee we were sorry we were so wrong we damaged so many people that's not that's not going to happen and it's rather petty of me to want that i should just be celebrating that they're fine (laughs) see you're you can you're allowed to have your feelings about it (laughs) it's important to (laughs) to give a damn and yeah. yeah, the whole early survivors movement was was led by mainly women, and it was there was a storefront service providers. You know, it was bottom up against the the experts were all against it. So that's yeah. that's given me, um, I think, a healthy distrust of the experts. So that's the big yeah. picture. The smaller picture is very much of the therapy, uh, the Gestalt therapy at Esalen and these encounter groups was very very confronted you know you'd go into these all-night marathons and people would tell each other well your character defect is your arrogance and and they would tear at each other thinking they were doing something in service of healing and i actually that was very destructive yeah very very destructive of a lot of people that sort of confrontive you know ripping and tearing and it's totally disrespectful to yeah I, I i you're already getting to one of my questions which was around um bridging the gap between spirituality and working in this medical model in the western world and something that i notice in my own uh learning of ifs and when I started using it with clients for the first time and walked a client through the unburdening sequence, I thought, oh my, oh my God, this is <laughs> spiritual work. This is a spiritual model, right? Uh-oh. I'm uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh-oh is right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. Or yeah. And all sorts of just like, oh my gosh, what does this mean? And I, I guess I notice from the, from for what it's worth, this balance between IFS being accepted into the mainstream and into the medical model and practitioners and, you know, is it evidence-based or not? And, and you know, our insurance companies going to say it's okay? And then the deeply spiritual components of it, or even calling it a psycho-spiritual model. Um, yeah, I'm just going to let you <laughs> react to that. Yeah, I obviously have some energy around this. Yeah. As I explored the farther reaches of IFS, many of the ifs people including dick schwartz himself didn't want me to do it yeah they wanted me to keep my big mouth shut they said we don't this stuff happens it's real but we don't want to teach it until we get to the advanced levels because it will be used to discredit ifs yeah 
and I wouldn't keep my big mouth shut. And it, it cost, it cost me some. Um, I think IFS in many ways cleverly dumbs down spirituality <laughs> and disguises it enough so that it can sneak into our universities <laughs> and yeah. sneak into our churches where it's not so welcome. And yeah. the, the whole concept of self does that. Yeah. You know, it, it, it is, you know, and I think Dick has actually dumbed down self. Dick has this idea that all of us have this core the self, other people would call it the real self or something like that. And he characterizes it by eight C's, compassionate, curious, calm, creative, connected, courageous. There's a couple more, but you get the idea. They're all sort of standard qualities. Yeah. And that makes it kind of acceptable. I think self is really also luminous, vast, transcendent, <laughs> eternal <laughs> words you're not supposed to say in American universities these days. Yeah. That's one, you know, but once people start getting a taste of these realities inside their own mind, they, um, they, you know, it's like sort of a tro almost a Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. that's, that's gotten spiritual realities in, into academia. I think the 12 steps yeah. was sort of like this too, with the idea of higher power. Yeah, they got something fundamentally. Profound, yeah, whatever you perceive spiritual. that to be. Yeah, in a way that an atheist could accept it. Yeah, in twelve sub. Yeah, giving people permission to um, choose their higher power and whatever you yeah. see that as, right? And that made it more accessible to some people. Yeah, to a lot of people. To a lot of people. But, you know that there. You know they, you mention anything that sounds vaguely religious, and they go, eh. <laughs> You know, what kind of idiot are you? And then you, you go down by a beach, go, go on the beach by the ocean with them and say, hey, uh, which one's bigger, you or the ocean here? <laughs> you know? So it sort of gets it, gets it in, in a, yeah. I don't want to say sneaky. But. Yeah, but it has to be packaged in a way that um, is digestible to a lot of people or even people that come to therapy and say, I'm just here for my anxiety or I'm an indecisive person. And so I'm here to, for help with that. That might be the thing bringing them to therapy, right? Or what, what, what gets them through the door. Um, and you could say, well, yeah, you know, a part of you, um, uh, wants to go to the gym and a part of you doesn't. And most people can get on board with that as a very, you know, as a starting point for parts work. And some people are, they don't want to go beyond that. Right. They just want to get, especially young people, they want to get cleaned up enough to go back out and live, which, you know, totally appropriate. Yeah. In some stages of life. Yeah. Help me tamp down my symptoms enough to where I can get back out there and yeah. <laughs> keep doing what I'm doing. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, this show focuses primarily on trauma and about 90% of it so far is on IFS and trauma. When I was um, a trainee, I saw my th supervisor, who's still a great mentor to me, doing trauma work. And he would tell clients, and he didn't know about IFS at the time, that they have this untouchable core. So despite everything that's happened to them and all the ways in, f in which they feel like they're really effed up and broken, and um, how could anyone ever love me, and I'm disgusting and all this, that there's this untouchable core. And I remember um, seeing that and despite all of the brokenness and everything that they were coming in with people benefited from hearing that oh yeah it's an incredible point yeah most of my career until i got interested in these the others within us was men with extreme trauma histories like me. yeah and most of them i was told and most of them were told you didn't get the early attachment you're basically screwed expect a miserable little life here's all these pills that can help you limp along don't take risks don't you know all that kind of stuff that's all bullshit <laughs> yeah it's all about the limits of the therapist not about the limits of the client and yeah. this idea from dick that self this radiant energy that's got the eight c's can't be damaged it can't even be dirtied yeah and that's who you really are like 
after a big storm, you know, floods, your house is ruined, all that, but the clouds go back, the sun is there, undamaged, undirty. That was so important to me and many of the men I worked with. I'm wondering if you can, um, if we talk about your book for a little bit here and your, your work, um, for folks listening or who are new to this idea, what is an, an unattached burden? Okay. Um, when you go into a person's system with a parts work model, you meet all these different parts, protectors and exiles, and this self, which is always the witness, seeing all these things. And then if you go in deep enough, you start meeting things that are not from that person's personal lifetime. Now, the ones people are most comfortable with are called legacy burdens. They're things from your family or racial history. Yeah. And the reason why people are more comfortable with these, I think, there is hardcore scientific evidence that these exist. They're real. There's experiments we could go into. You can create these in rats. And that's the standard of truth these days. If you can do it to rats, it's real. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So legacy burdens pass the rat test. And there's incredible research, especially around the Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. These events that happened to their lineage generations yeah. ago have big effects on the people now. Yeah. So that's solid science, epigenetics. You know, yeah. there's a whole scientific field around it. So then yeah. people, then that sort of typically cracks the door open, and oh, there's stuff inside of me that's not part of my life that comes yeah. from the world. Well, there are these other things, and Dick divides it into unattached burdens and guides. Yeah. Which are basically the other things that are harmful to you and the other things that are good for you. I, I don't like doing that so much because just by naming them you have to decide if they're good or bad right at the get-go it's yeah. like you judge them as they walk in the door i'm not so comfortable with that so i've started using other other names like uh, an external energy or something that's not part of your own personal lifetime experience yeah and another thing i could say about this Oh, let me back up a little. This <laughs> you know, <I've> <laughs> take your time. Twenty years studying this, so it's kind of hard to put it in 30, 40 minutes. My undergraduate and a little bit of graduate work were in anthropology. The very concept of mental illness itself is a cultural creation of the modern West. Yes, it did not exist in most other cultures, and yeah. the way they saw these things was vastly different, and how they saw them had real important effects on how these things affected people and they very often the, the phrase anthropologists would use to try not to put stick our values and concepts on them was idiom of distress you know they talk about the idioms of distress of different cultures mm. and um civilizations one of the most maybe the most common idiom of distress is this what seems to be a basic biopsychological dynamic that happens in pretty much every culture we've ever discovered and in every area of history we have records of. This basic biopsychological dynamic can have huge effects on a person's life for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. The metaphor most often used to describe this is spirit possession. The metaphor doesn't matter so much to me, but the phenomena is incredibly important and deserves our study. Yeah. Yeah. People have reactions to what we call it, similar to, um, you know, I, I help um, teach at uh, Derek Scott's program. That's where I just was today. And when we're learning IFS, a lot of times we wonder, like, what kind of part is this? <laughs> right. And some degree it doesn't matter right that become becomes more about people needing to have a label that they're comfortable with so i can then move forward in working with this client in their part whether or not it's a firefighter right mm -hmm. so for this label or even i know um there's there i heard you talk about some debate around um uh, you including spirit possessions in the the subtitle of your book yeah dick did not like that yeah 
<laughs> he did not like that at all. Yeah. The word that really irritates Dick is entity. Yeah. So they're going to think I'm a California kook. <laughs> and I just tell them, blame me. Yeah. If there's anything in this book you don't like, it's probably weird, Bob. Yeah. The guy in the Santa <laughs> Cruz mountains, right? Uh, yeah. I'm a, I'm only a, an hour from you in San Francisco. So I, it's not, <laughs> this type of stuff is not that far out of my realm of living here or being a therapist here in the West Coast. You so, know, I think you know. this, is, this is part of the arrogance of academia. Mm -hmm. You know, Robert Ornstein, the great neuroscientist, he called academia the Western intellectual tradition, T-W-I-T, -T, twit. <laughs> he would say, twit thinks. If, if you look at uh, the data, like the Pew Research and the Gallup polls, more than 50% of the people in America believe in spirit possession. So it, mm. it's not that it's not just us kooks in California. It's very widespread. But in academia, among professors, it's close to zero. I, I do wonder about that because I also um, kind of uh, <laughs> failed out of academia in a way and that I was on my way after getting my master's degrees to go be a professor and do research. Um, and uh, long story short, politics and department, you know, uh, drama kind of kicked me out, of, not kicked me out of the program, but I kind of fell out of it because the culture was too much. Um, but there are a lot of people who are there and in that culture who, first of all, have strict expectations around publishing and how much you're going to publish and what you're going to publish about. And some of my research was not supported when my faculty mentor left for another program. And so all of a sudden you're not doing the right kind of research that our university wants or that we want to be known for, right? Or even going back to this piece around evidence base and how hard IFS has fought for it to be considered evidence-based by the, the powers that be. Um, yeah. And it is officially certified as an evidence-based there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's set. A lot of times I can sort of laugh about it, but that's just to cover the tears. It is so sad that our uh, major institutions are like this. Yeah. It's just. <sighs> <laughs> My sense is that your work is helping with that and the work you do to bring this to um, the IFS community. I know you work with therapists and practitioners who want to learn how to work with unattached burdens. And I also hear the the big sigh about the greater systemic uh, limitations and, yeah, and it's stuckness. Still, it's still uh, rampant inside the IFS community. One of the mm -hmm. lead trainers wrote me an email saying, oh, your book's wonderful. You, you know, I really like the way you handled this, blah, 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 blah. And then I, I emailed her back. Can I, can I use your name? Can I use your quotes without your name even? She said, let me think about it. She thought she got back to me a month later and said, no, Bob, I don't want you using my quotes, even anonymously. Don't use my name. I need to be on good terms with the Institute. Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, you've got your but, work you know, One of my me. advantages is I'm really an old fart. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need a career. I don't need to impress anybody. You well, know? yeah. I mean, <laughs> what can they do to me? Yeah. Lock me yeah. up. For yeah. being, having unpopular ideas. Yeah, there's must there's a freedom to that of kind of doing your own thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and get, get being able to write about these ideas or even write about your book. Um, I'm curious to bring I, it. I yeah, go ahead. Try and research it fairly exhaustively. Yeah, so I think anybody with an open mind who read that book would come away going, well. Might not be right, but it's not totally crazy. There's something happening here. Yeah. Well, I, I've i seen it with my own eyes and seen it even in, um, there's a demo that people can find on your website where you're working with an unattached burden mm -hmm. through one of Derek's videos. Um, and uh, so I've, I've seen this process. I've seen you do it. Um, for people that haven't seen it or just getting familiar with this idea of unattached burdens, um, how do you know when it is one and and what to do next okay that's one of the most that's one of the two or three most important questions about these things yeah i think the most important thing is we tend to be terrified of this idea 
that there could possibly be anything inside of us that's not part of our brain. That is like, you know, really bad. And there's a great anthropologist named Tanya Lurman who writes about this. She calls it the Citadel model of mind, mm -hmm. that our mind is this fortified thing. It's contained in this nice bony structure here. Everything inside of it is proper, is private. Everything inside of it is our property and um, it constitutes our identity. That looks really big and powerful, right? It's actually incredibly fragile because it's totally brittle. You have one thought come into your mind or hear one voice and you go, oh my God, my brain's broken. Yeah. And either you have a shame attack and hide it or <laughs> you go on meds for the rest of your life and many most yeah. other cultures have considered the mind porous which yeah. i believe it is that's a big the big mega point or the, the you know the overarching structure of my book is mind is porous yeah and when you have that when you have that view and you know that that's true you're much stronger and more resilient yeah okay so yeah. that said how do you know there's something, there's a voice in your head going, you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. Very often that's just a part. And you find the first thing you do is you check its intention. Oh, what's so important about me believing you're an idiot? Well, then you won't do something stupid. Oh, what's so good about me not doing something stupid? I don't want you going out in the world and taking risks. Why don't, what's good about me not taking risks? You won't be hurt. Mm -hmm. That's a part. It's got a good intention. Somewhere in there, under all that huffing and puffing, is a good intention. Save the person from pain. If that you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're an idiot was some kind of unattached burden, you'd, you'd ask the same kind of questions. Well, what's good about making me think I'm an idiot? Well, then you won't do anything in the world. Well, what's good? What's good? You know, like what's good about what's good over and over until you get down to something. And it, the answer might be something like, well, then you'll be home alone and miserable and I can feed off of you. Or I'll be able to squash you then once mm. I've destroyed all your connections. Yeah. That's not a part. <laughs> yeah. So that's the first thing. Check its intention really yeah. carefully looking for, you know, a good intention. And the second thing is just asking it directly. Are you a part of me? Right. And you have the person do that over and over again. Very often it won't answer the question or it will make excuses. It'll say stuff like, well, I've been here a long time. Or you wish I was a part of you. Or <laughs> all, sorts, all sorts of gas like that. It will avoid the question. For mm -hmm. some reason, they don't seem to be able to lie about this one question. Everything else they lie about. Mm -hmm. So those are the two most basic steps and the, the yeah. third thing that's super important these things get their power by scaring us when we're no longer scared of them they lose all power yeah you you mentioned that a number of times in when you're walking through your sequence for working with unattached burdens and for the therapist going back to um do i have parts that are afraid right now um, and checking for fear in my system and in the client's system this, it seems yeah. like an essential part to your, the process yeah. you've developed if a therapist mm -hmm. is afraid of this, they can't do this work. They have to go work with their parts that are afraid first. Yeah. On that note, I'm I'm really curious. Um, number one, have you ever been afraid of them? Number two, has this ever backfired? Or when you've been working with an unattached burden and it's gone poorly? Um, in other words, I imagine there must have been some flops along the way as you kind of discovered your <laughs> you your <betcha>. process and <laughs> yeah created your protocol because it seems so nice and organized and doable but i'm like nothing like that comes easily no yeah um this this is going to cheer everybody right up they can sometimes seem to jump from the client into the therapist and that used to really bother me that that very idea that that could happen or you know yuck yeah. but when i when i really at a deeper level lost all fear of them it didn't matter so much 
I worked for, for quite a while with this Buddhist Lama. And he would say, oh, oh, those dark spirits, they're around me all the time. They're around me all the time. He said, it's like bugs on a summer night when you turn the lights on. And he, he smiled and he giggled and he said, but they don't bother me. They don't bother me. They don't bother me. Just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm used was, to no, it. It's his ass part of, right. you know. So I think if you really, really work with all your parts that are afraid of the unknown and afraid of this weird stuff, they don't bother you. They don't bother you. Yeah. But, you know, I've had, I had one in me that was uh, destroying my eyesight. And I worked with that with Dick, and we were able to get it out. And I'm doing way better than the doctors um, thought was possible. I was told I was going blind about 10 years ago. Mm. And I'm doing way better. And matter of fact, I don't even need the uh, treatments hardly ever anymore. And allegedly, people don't you know, go into remission from wet macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. But knock on wood. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And we, we had very clear images of what that unattached burden was, how it was attacking my retina. It looked like a spider with a scorpion's tail that was stinging the back my retina. And the physical symptom of wet macular degeneration is blisters on the retina. Mm. And the, the uh, spider, scorpion, whatever you want to call it, had a lot of my mother's energy in it. And she was really, you know, I think the name for my parents is evil rather than just dysfunctional. I mean, I don't, I don't like that word. Mm, yeah. So, you know, I've had personal experience. And if you don't, if you are afraid of these things and you don't work with them, they can cause damage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I know that another way in which you help is uh, not only teaching therapists about how to do this work, um, but also sometimes you, you have a, a really unique offering of where a therapist, like an IFS therapist, can bring their client and the two, the three of you can meet and you can help the client um, while with the therapist also there. How, how did you kind of come up with that setup and why is that setup effective? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I got that idea, but it works really, really well. Yeah. And, you know, basically I just do the session with the client while the therapist watches. Yeah. And I, after the fact, I have lots of good reasons. <laughs> but I think I just sort of stumbled into it or intuition or guidance, who knows. But I can piggyback on all the rapport the therapist has built up with the client for however long they've been meeting. Right. That makes such a huge difference right away. Number two, the therapist sees exactly what I'm doing and knows it firsthand, first person, you know, real time, which makes it, which makes an increase, it demystifies it. It can help that therapist lose their, or work with their parts who are afraid of these things. And one thing I do when, when the therapist can't show up with the client, I encourage the client to record the session mm -hmm. and then show it, show it to the therapist. You know, yeah. And it also, hopefully, the th you know, the therapist might learn something. Yeah. And I do have I do have clients that I fail with. I mean, of course. You know. Yeah. And they're usually Why do you think... greatest teachers. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. <laughs> we really learn from those. I I um, I, I had a you know a, a bunch of clients yesterday, and um, you know most of the five of the sessions were really good and I felt quite effective. And then one session didn't go very well. And I learned a lot. <laughs> so it was the yeah. pain, painful you're teacher. You're paying an incredibly high tuition. So you might as well do the learning. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Um, yeah. I, I, I want to go back for a second to um, well, you mentioned this idea and going back to the porous mind, uh, which obviously we could do a whole hour on or hours on. Um, and with most people, especially in our culture, favoring this, the Citadel model. And so some people that have that idea of consciousness. Um, and yet also for me, you know, I grew up in a Christian church where people would say like the Lord 
gave me this answer, right? The Lord gave me this information and we felt called to do blah, blah, blah. Or we asked the Lord and he told me to go work on a farm or to go work at Starbucks or whatever it is, right? Yeah. And so we're on one hand, we're really familiar with that. Or even when I first used to work in a psych hospital and I was a young you know, grad student, um, and people were hearing voices, right? Or people were getting information and they were being locked up for it. Um, and, and I remember one time we're sitting with a, a client who'd been diagnosed as psychotic, schizophrenic, um, and he would have moments where he was very incoherent and it just sounded like randomness. And then moments that actually made a lot of sense. And it seemed like uh, maybe someone should sit and actually listen to this guy. Right, but that was no none of that was happening in this no, no, you hospital. Could lose your license for yeah. uh, ha helping a uh, quote psychotic talk to the voices in his head. Yeah, it, yeah. Were, it was colluding with the illusion, and you could lose your license. Yeah, and that's not so long ago. You, you still could get in trouble for doing that. Yeah, yeah. I want to tell one of my favorite little stories. Please. It's about Milton Erickson. Uh, he was a psychiatrist, worked inpatient much of his career, also a great hypnotherapist later. Yeah. But on this one ward, he was brought on the ward, and there was a guy who just, they'd, you know, bring him out of his room, get some food in him, and all he would do all day long is stand in the hallway and talk word salad. You know, just mate. So Dr. Erickson saw him, and then Dr. Erickson went and stood beside him and studied his word salad and transcribed a bunch of it and figured out the words and the grammar and what was going on. And then Dr. Erickson would go stand next to him in the hallway and talk word salad back to him for a few minutes. In only two or three days in the middle of the word salad, the guy turned to Dr. Erickson and said, cut it out, doc, and then snapped back into his word salad. So just by learning the client's language, Dr. Erickson broke through to a man who'd been totally isolated for years and years and years. Yeah. And we're taught not to learn our client's language, but to force our language down their throats. Yeah. I mean, it's so crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's so disrespectful, too. Well, I, I, I even have clients that come to me, and I think I... I think they trust me or we've been working together for a while or a few months and then they're hesitant to share something about their spirituality, right? Um, or th there's this fear that a client will bring of, I I'm afraid this will make me sound crazy, yeah. right? That either I'm hearing this, this voice, or I'm not afraid of it. It's just kind of there. And it tells me either you suck or maybe it tells you you're awesome and you're, you're God. I don't know. It's like, wow, let's, can we get to know that voice? <laughs> right. Yeah. But yeah. Well, there's, you know, Socrates uh, heard a voice his whole life. That's that's the origin of Western philosophy, was a voice in a man's head. <laughs> I mean, it's so ironic. Yeah. And now we try to claim that's a sign of insanity. So hopefully that's changing, but I don't, uh, too slowly. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do you want to make sure people hear from this conversation? Um, whether it's about the, the, the porous mind, unattached burdens, more about your book, or just your life in general. I mean, there's, there's just so okay. many directions we could go. Yeah, a couple things I want to say. Yeah. As I look at the anthropological evidence of this porous mind and experience of stuff inside our subjective realm that's not part of us, the vast majority is beneficial. It's guides, mentors, gods, uh, demiurges. <laughs> but, and people spend immense amounts of energy and discipline eliciting this kind of contact. And I think the only reason why in IFS it's the unattached burdens and the nasty stuff first is because we're coming at it from an attitude of relieving pathology. Yeah. So I want to put it in that framework that overwhelmingly this idea of porous mind is a positive experience. You know, all the poets who talk about the muses and hearing the creative voice and, you know, yeah. all of that com comes from this realm too. Yeah. So that's one thing. I and I just want to say, if you stop and think about it for a minute or two, mind obviously is porous. Every living system is surrounded by a semi-permeable membrane. 
every cell is surrounded by a semi-permeable membrane. That if there's a rigid thing around it, it's dead. Dang. <laughs> and there's all sorts of very hard science ways we can know this is true. Gregory Bateson wrote a great book called Mind and Nature. And it's a book length exposition of this basic idea that mind and nature evolve together. It's actually a dynamic relationship. You cannot understand mind outside of that relationship and the attempts to do so are doomed to failure and they're doomed to be destructive. Yeah. And that would describe Western psychology. <laughs> yeah, and medicine, right? Of, yeah. We could kind of play God in our own lives and yeah. there's great we, power we in being that, able to fix yeah. people. And the indigenous people, you know, they talk about all my relations. It's not an I it, it's an I thou. Yeah. Yeah. Um I, I do want to ask you about something. This is almost like a, a more basic IFS question, but in in my experience, especially with clients that have significant trauma in their background and a lot of childhood trauma, um, we have come across some very pissed off protector parts. Oh yeah. They're very pissed off right away, and especially on the first meeting, the first uh, the client is meeting that protector part. They're extremely pissed off. Sometimes they have violent urges or they want payback. Or if uh, I had a client where mom um, was the abuser and this part wanted to kill mom. Um, yeah. yeah. Your reaction to, to that? Perfectly natural. Makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I my I can tell you in that moment, I remember my client was kind of horrified by it, mm -hmm. right? And almost scared to tell me, well, this, this part wants to kill mom. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense, right? Um, and totally I've also been told to sense. help, uh, to perhaps help the part do that as part of a corrective experience and a yeah, redo. in the inner world. And I will yeah. make it very clear to In the inner world, yeah. This totally makes sense. And I'm with you 100%. And I'll do everything I can to stop you from doing this in the external world because it'll damage you and, you know, hurt other people. Yeah. Doesn't mean I don't respect you and don't honor your anger and rage. And then there are other ways down the road we could, we could work with that. One other thing I want to mention, because it's super important, and many therapists get confused around this and unattached burdens is perpetrator interjects. Yeah. If you think of a little kid in a room and they're being molested and beaten and raped by some adult, who has all the power in that room? Right. The perp, obviously. So some courageous and self-sacrificing part of that kid goes out there and takes on some of the perpetrator energy to try and protect the kid. Yeah. And then what happens is all the other parts of the kid hate it. It went out there yeah. and did this very difficult thing to save the kid. And now it's getting hated by all the other parts of the kid and it's sacrificed everything and it's being hated. So then us therapists come along since that part has some perpetrator energy in it and we are people often mistake it for a ub or do other things to you know amputate it and destroy it and it's you know and it's actually a hero yeah so and those are parts that frequently get mistaken for ubs and that's a tragedy those parts are real heroes self-sacrificing yeah. heroes you know, qu these quote rehabilitation programs for um, the perpetrators are largely focused on kind of managing the the behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how do we get you to not do this thing again, right? This un unspeakable thing. Yeah. And sometimes that's necessary. I taught IFS several times in clinics for eating disorders. Mm -hmm. We had to get those people eating or they would die. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, you know, all we could, we don't want to pick a fight with the eating disorder. You know, we say we respect you, you're doing this for a good reason, and we need to keep the body alive. Yeah. And, you know, so yeah, I also worked with sex offenders a fair amount. And mm -hmm. I think that's the first step. Yeah.
It's and yeah. but then you can deal with the traumas that are underneath, uh, underneath the offending behavior. That's right. Yeah. Um, we've got a few minutes left here, Bob, and the the time has flown by, at least for me. And um, yeah, anything else people should should know, at least for today. And I'd love to have you back for another conversation. There's just such a richness right. to your work and your life. So I have a million other questions, but for today, what else should people okay, hear? Well, and then of I course, to, yeah. yeah, I have something that's really been up for me a lot. Okay. The finest minds on our planet know almost nothing. We're astoundingly ignorant as a species. At the very, very best, the most brilliant of us might be in kindergarten. <laughs> and that's probably an overly yeah. generous assessment of human intellectual progress. Yeah, I'm offended, need, but go on. We need, yeah, <laughs> we need to learn to welcome not knowing and being in ignorance and just curiosity, wonder, and awe, and not not take our not take ourselves too seriously. I think you know most of what I've spent my lifetime developing is probably wrong in very significant ways, if not entirely, but perhaps I can be usefully wrong. I can be wrong in a way that other people can climb up on top of that and yeah, get a little bit closer on to it. something mm -hmm. real and a little bit more meaningful. So yeah. I think that kind of basic humility yeah. is really important. We don't have any answers. We're just cracking yeah. doors open and getting little peaks and and that takes tremendous pressure off of the therapist listening to know it all or to know more than their clients right you know i i saw a client for years um and we spent 3 or 4 years undoing the damage that a therapist did to her of power and control and i'm the expert and you're living your life wrong and um all all these things and she just basically unraveled this client's psyche by the end of it and her sense of self was um just completely in, in pieces. So the power that we have is never lost on me. I mean, we learn, uh, you know, uh, about this in graduate school. And yet a lot of therapists still end up in this position of, I need to know a lot. And my clients are coming to me because I know a lot and I can um, take some of that knowledge and put it in their head, right? Or they come and they say, show me how to regulate. And I, I look around for, you know, regulation exercises and teach them that. And then the client comes back and goes, well, those didn't work anymore. Can you teach me more? Right. And um, t teach me about how to do my life better. Right. And it fundamentally undermines, you know, uh, yeah, who they are, autonomy and their and, humanity. And I've come to really, really, really profoundly believe and trust that people in their tissues, in their bones, in their blood, have an ancient, ancient wisdom that they can connect to. And it's really my job to help get the garbage out of the way a little bit so that they can get a glimpse of that ancient wisdom that's deep in them. And when they get that and get a little taste of that and go, oh, this is in here. I don't need Bob. I don't need... Then they're self-healing. Then their healing is going to become generative yeah. and just grow. That's the kind of change we need to start creating yeah. or foster it because we don't really yeah. create it to me that's what ifs is all about and going from this uh, idea from carl rogers of okay regard the client positively right okay that the relationship we have with our clients is going to be a positive one i'm going to regard them positively no matter what even if they do horrible things right ifs just it's just so much more profound, I think, in regarding humanity and then this idea that um, you have inside of you what it takes and this self that can um, that can heal your parts and your wounded parts and all this. Um, and the therapist's job is to help them access that yeah. self. Yeah. So, I, yeah. it's you know, I think the word respect is. If I had to summarize IFS in one word, it would be respect. And the IFS community doesn't use that word hardly ever. It's very, yeah. rare. and I'm not maybe because it doesn't start with C, so it can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe. I don't know, but it's... might need to start a new list of our words um, for for self. Um, Bob, thank you again so much for the conversation, for being here, for the work you're doing. Um, I've really enjoyed your book. Got a lot out of it. Um, for folks that are interested in you and your work, or even 
how you help people. Can you let us know how people can find you and, and what you do okay. offer? I have a website, robertfalconer.us. And thank God I have a wonderful IT person because I'm really bad at that stuff. <laughs> so and there's lots there. There's a YouTube channel. I have a meditation channel called Mindlessness Meditation because anytime I'm in my mind, I know I'm in a bad neighborhood. <laughs> there you and go. I think some of those meditations can be very helpful. There, you know, yeah. there are YouTubes and demos and all sorts yeah. of stuff, and the books. And I'll have a new book out in about a month. I hope. Great! Wow, you're you're so, moving fast on that. Yeah, well, I'm old. I got to. Uh, <laughs> this this one's a book of the quotations I've collected over fifty years. Oh, right. Connect healing and spirituality, and the title is. When you're going through hell, keep going. Love that. Can't wait to read it. Um, Bob, thank you again. We'll put links to all of that um, in the description for folks that are listening. And uh, you can click through uh, that way and learn more about uh, Bob and his books and his offerings. So, um, Bob, thanks again uh, for, for being here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Going Inside. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe wherever you're listening or watching and share your favorite episode with a friend. You can follow me on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at John Clark Therapy and apply to work with me one-on-one -on -one at johnclarktherapy.com. See you next time.